Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our panel today that's being held through the IPO's Diversity and Inclusion Committee and our Outreach Subcommittee. We're very excited to have this opportunity to speak to everyone who is in attendance today and to share some of the experiences, a wealth of experiences from these distinguished IP professionals. This panel is entitled Start Your Path to a Successful Career in Intellectual Property, the acronym IP. This is again hosted by the IPO DNI Committee, our Outreach Subcommittee, and we welcome our panelists, Gloria Fuentes from Merck, Lee Anthony Edwards, and Elaine Spector. Lee Anthony is a associate at the law firm of Dinsmore and Scholl, and Elaine Spector is a partner at Herity and Herity. And this panel will be moderated today by myself, Ritu Singh, who is a patent attorney at Dinsmore and Scholl. I'm gonna go ahead and just give you a brief introduction um, to who I am, and we will follow with each of the panelists further expanding upon their backgrounds and what their experiences in IP have entailed and a little more external information about each one of them. So again, my name is Ritu Singh. I'm a patent attorney at Dinsmore and Scholl. Um, some things I do outside of being a patent attorney, I'm a community orchestra volunteer. I play a violin um, in, in that orchestra. I am involved with a variety of community organizations. One such organization is the South Asian Bar Association Foundation. I am a trustee and treasurer of that organization. Fun fact is I've been skydiving twice, even though that was granted a long time ago. Um, I like to travel when I have uh, time to. My happy places, um, Vegas and Disney, I do like places that entertain. And some things about my background, I have a BS in industrial engineering, a MS in electrical and computer engineering, and a JD from The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, also my hometown. My uh, professional experience, I, before going to law school, worked for two years as an application engineer with a startup. Um, it started up through an incubator, and between the two years I was there, went from about eight employees to about 40 globally. So that was really an exciting experience that led me towards patent law and uh, really wanting to help with startups and their IP. I um, have had 10 plus years of professional experience as a IP professional and the last five years, of which I um, lateraled in, which means I basically transitioned into a new firm. Um, and I've been at Dinsmore and Scholl since then. The next panelist I would like to have introduced themselves is Gloria. Gloria, if you can go ahead and, and introduce yourself in this slide. Hi. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, so my name is Gloria Fuentes. Um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, both of my parents were teachers, so they always uh, wanted us to go uh, to the mainland, the U.S., uh, to the best schools that we could get into. So I moved to the U.S. for college when I was 17. I went to Cornell University. I studied microbiology. At that time, I had no thought of ever going to law school. It just wasn't my thing. I really like science. After my bachelor's, I went to the University of Rochester and got a PhD, and I thought I would do research. Uh, but, you know, life takes strange turns. I ended up going to law school with the idea of becoming a patent lawyer um, because I had met some patent lawyers um, through my, my PhD work. And that has worked out great. Um, after law school, I worked in a New York law firm for seven years, and then I moved in-house at Merck, a pharmaceutical company, and I've been working at Merck in various roles ever since, and I really love it. My happy place, though, it's not Merck, it's the beach uh, in Puerto Rico or really anywhere. I love lakes, too. I just love being by the water. Um, I have two kids and a puppy that we just got yesterday, so... Uh, I am busy with that, but when I am not taking care of them, I love to read. Um, I, leave, I read a lot, um, historical fiction and uh, nonfiction books. I, I just love read, 
I'll, anything that comes my way. And that's, uh, that's my background. Thank you, Gloria. We'll go ahead and have the next panelist, Elaine Spector, introduce herself. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Spector and I'm a patent attorney with Herity and Herity. We're an IP boutique uh, located in Fairfax, Virginia, but I actually work remotely, so something I really enjoy. And I see some familiar faces from our women's workshop. Hello. Uh, my background, I have a BS in mechanical engineering, and um, I went to University of Maryland at College Park. I got my JD at University of Baltimore. I'm actually uh, from Baltimore. I'm still living in Baltimore, even though I did live in D.C. for about a decade. Uh, I started my practice at a small IP boutique in Bethesda, where I really practiced every area of IP. I did trademark, prosecution, litigation, patent prosecution, patent litigation, anything that came in the door, I handled. And that really set me up uh, to have a unique position when I moved to a larger IP boutique, because I wasn't necessarily pigeonholed in a particular area. When um, other partners, trademark partners found out or litigation partners found out I had this background experience and at small firms, you actually take the depositions. There were five attorneys. So we had a case, they sent me, they sent me for, for uh, judges conferences and you, you're just thrown into the fire. So one thing that was great about working at that small IP boutique is that I had a really wonderful experience and it set me up for my move to a larger IP boutique where I worked for about seven years and just really did a variety of IP work. Um, I also had some time at a large uh, GP practice that was also interesting, but at that point I had children and so I wanted to focus on steadier work. The litigation was uh, harder for me to maintain um, and have that balance with our kids. I still did a bit of it, um, but after I spent um, four weeks in the Eastern District of Texas for a four week trial, when I had my three kids, that's when I decided it was time to move to another um, uh, position. And that's when I found a position in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University, where I practiced for about six years. And you know, a lot of people ask, well, how can you leave an in-house position to go back to private practice? Because private practice is so hard and challenging and it's a lot of hours. Uh, I was able to transition beautifully into this position at Herity and Herity because they offer remote work and flexibility. So I was able to agree to a lesser schedule, a reduced hour schedule, less billable hour requirements, um, and be able to practice from home. So those commutes, I used to commute from Baltimore to DC, and um, yeah, I did that for about six or seven years. That was brutal. And then commuting downtown Baltimore from where I am uh, in northern Baltimore County was also, you know, it takes a lot of time, about an hour and a half to two hours a day. So Working remotely was a game changer for me and um, really working for a firm that kind of supports my interests and really has a focus on life work balance has been has been wonderful. So there's a way to practice law and have a life. And I'm sure a lot of you would like to have a life when you practice law. So um, my background is I'm a first generation Greek American. Both my parents were born in Greece, in Rhodes, Greece. And you can see uh, at the uh, bottom right hand corner that is a picture of my mo my mother's village in Lindos uh, in Rhodes. And so we spent a couple of summers there. We've taken the kids. Um, it's a beautiful place. If you haven't visited Greece, I highly recommend it. Uh, I am married with three kids. I have a house full of teenagers. Um, COVID provided an opportunity for me to say it was the first time I was happy I have just teenagers because they're self-sufficient. So it's been an easier transition because I've already been working from home. And um, our family loves to travel. And one fun fact is that I was an extra in the movie Runaway Ride with Richard Gere. I have a picture of Richard Gere, too. He's very, he's very handsome. And um, you see me for a second. So you'll never know where I am. But if you ever watch um, Runaway Bride, it's in the New York bar scene. And I'm at a booth with some other, actually, with some fellow law students. So this was recorded back in the late 90s. So also, I like to jog. So that's, that's kind of my background. Well, thank you for that, Elaine. Um, I'm gonna have to watch that movie and look for that, that scene now. I watched it when it came out, so. 
my kids, I played it too many times. They're like, come on, enough already. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have our next panelist introduce himself as well. Just get to I hear Lee Anthony Edwards. Lee Anthony, if you'd like to say some words about your background. Uh, yes, hello, everybody. Um, it's, it's good to see so many faces, and I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, Many of you guys, this is the first time seeing me, even the uh, fellow subcommittee members. Um, I usually do our, our calls on, on just audio, so hi. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Lee Anthony Edwards, and I'm an attorney at Dinsmore Shoal. I'm a fifth year associate. Um, I think I'm the only panelist who does not have a patent background, so I, gotta, I have a little bit of a different perspective on the IP work. Um, I practice mostly trademarks and copyrights. Um, and then a lot of data privacy compliance agreement work. Um, uh, so we, we do, my work ranges from, uh, you know, portfolio management for uh, large multinational companies um, to just copyright applications for um, uh, content providers and content holders, um, you know, TV and, and uh, music and video games. Um, kind of, I, I like to call it the fun stuff. And then uh, we handle some litigation as well. Um, we, we're kind of, um, you know, a jack of all trades on the uh, non-patent IP side. So it's uh, allowed me to do some fun stuff and get my hands dirty with a, a lot of different things. And then uh, uh, as far as my educational background, I'm from Southern California, um, but I've been here in Cincinnati and, and did some more in Shoals Cincinnati office for about, uh, you know, six years now. Um, so it's a transition, but I like it a lot. Um, I went to California State University, um, got a the, uh, the old political science degree, uh, no, no technical background there, uh, and then and stayed here locally in Cincinnati for my law degree at um, University of Cincinnati. Um, I, I mentioned I practice in the data privacy space. I'm certified with the information, um, uh, the IAPP, and I have my CIPP US certification, which basically means I, I'm certified to practice uh, information privacy law here in the United States. Um, and uh, any, anyone that knows a little bit about uh, uh, privacy um, here in the United States, we don't have a big comprehensive um, privacy regime like GDPR over in the EU. So it's a lot of different law, a lot of state law, um, a lot of different regulatory bodies involved, and it kind of depends on sectors. So um, no day looks like the last one in my world, which is part of the, part of the reason I like it. So. Uh, more about me and my personal profile. Um, African American man, like I said, I um, hail from Southern California. Um, married and exciting news, I do have a baby on the way. I'm expecting a, my firstborn son in about a month and a half. Um, really excited about that. And uh, I'm a tech junkie, which is cool because I get to work on a lot of cool things and support our clients in that way, especially in the data privacy space. Um, work with AI and uh, 3D printing and um, all that cool kind of tech stuff. Um, and uh, fun but strange fact about me, I'm probably the biggest donut foodie you know. I go to donut uh, shops in literally every state and just so I can try the best one. Uh, my wife thinks it's weird. I think most people would think it's weird and probably should, but uh, I have a few pictures there, some of my favorites. Um, uh, Seattle, Chicago, uh, and Indiana, and uh, I think you can see that Kind of small, but it's uh, Voodoo Donuts in Austin, Texas, represented there. Um, and in my happy place is any place I can get to travel. Um, and that that other um, mashup of photos there is uh, from my trip last year to um, uh, Tulum, and we got to go and see some of the uh, the pyramids there, um, which it doesn't look that big until you're at the top. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's about me. I, I keep it brief. Thank you for that, Lee Anthony. And just so everybody knows what we're going to be doing for this re the rest of the call, we do have a series of questions that we're going to ask the panelists to answer. Um, we are going to reserve a little bit of time at the end for a Q&A. So if you have questions during this discussion, please feel free to use the chat feature to ask your questions, and we'll address some of those questions toward the end of this session. Uh, again, I'm going to ask that everyone um, who is on the call outside of the panelists make sure they are on mute. Periodically, I might go through and make sure to mute anybody who might not be. This will assist with 
um, any type of feedback and also allow all of you the opportunity to clearly hear the responses being provided by our esteemed panelists today. And with that, Lee Anthony, since we are on your, your slide and you um, just went last, I might ask you to go first with this, this next, this first question. Basically, I want to ask each of the panelists, starting with you, what first inspired you to pursue a career in law? And then more specifically, what directed you to a career in IT law? Uh, sure. I think the answers uh, to both of those are a little bit different. Uh, growing up as a, as a black male in, in Southern California, I think um, it's, I, was, I quickly identified the, the power of, of um, position as a lawyer and the ability to affect change and uh, seeing all the different civil rights lawyers and legends out there uh, being able to um, positively uh, make change and create change in the world uh, really inspired me. So that's why I got into the law. Uh, but again, I don't practice uh, civil rights law at all. But uh, uh, I think when I got to law school, I just was really intrigued by uh, working with cool brands and uh, getting to work with you know, partner with uh, clients. Uh, I think IP is one of the unique spaces where you get to partner with clients and actually not be seen as, as a cost. You, you get to see more of a, as a, a, a partner and, and uh, someone who kind of helps the business. Um, so I was really intrigued by that. Well, thank you for that. I think we'll go ahead and ask our next panelist. I'm going to try to keep the slides on. Well, there we go. <laughs> who, who would be asking next? So, Lane, um, what would your response be to your how you first became interested in law and then more specifically IP law? So it actually happened at the same time because uh, there was a family friend that worked at Westinghouse. And the family friend when I was in high school, as I, I think I was a junior or senior, said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or, but, you know, what do you think you'll study in college? And I said, well, I'm really good at math and my dad's an engineer. So I think I'll go into engineering. But, you know, I really love the law. I would love, I mean, like, I, I love, I love arguing. <laughs> and I like kind of building up a case and I'm really into it, the justice piece. So uh, he said, you know, um, you can think about a career in patent law because you have to have a technical background to pursue patent law. And so he planted that seed back when I was a junior. And so I really went through engineering school with the vision of wanting to become a patent attorney. I didn't want to practice en as an engineer. That really wasn't really where my interest was. I really wanted to go into law. So one, one thing that was wonderful about that is that once you've been through engineering and you go to law school, for me, law school was a lot of work, but pretty easy. I mean, compared to engineering, it was if people would complain about how hard law school is. I said, you all have no idea. Uh, it, this, this is so much easier. And you could really get into the cases. This happened to this person. You know, there, it was so much more interesting than kind of the theoretical engineering that I was um, learning at Maryland. So, um, yeah, I was pretty lucky to learn about it at an early age because I know a lot of people don't find out about it until they're practicing engineers and they decide on a career change. And Gloria, what about your experiences? What led you to a career in IP law? Gloria, can you um, hear us? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so for me, you know, I think I mentioned when I was introducing myself, I mean, law school is not something that was on my mind when I was an undergraduate and even a graduate student. I really like science, um, but I didn't like blood, so I knew med school wasn't for me. So I just went to grad school as sort of sort of the default. And while I was in grad school, um, my PhD uh, thesis advisor was working as an expert in a patent litigation. Uh, but he really didn't like the lawyers he was working with, so he refused to talk to them. And he's like, you know, they can talk to you, and then you talk to me, and then you go tell the lawyers what I said. Uh, so I, was, I had sort of that experience to get to know sort of a little bit of what patent law was about, and I had a lot of interactions with patent attorneys that really opened my eyes as to sort of this new area. And I thought, 
Uh-huh. I'd be really good at it because I really like the science, but I also like, I didn't want to be sitting in a lab on a bench doing experiments. Um, so I applied to law school while I was in, conducting my PhD and then just finished my PhD and went right to law school after that. And the rest is history. And then actually, it was about being in the right place at the right time. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, you know, life would have turned out differently. I was say, that's actually a great segue into your next question. Just expand upon it and your experience in grad school. Um, our next question is, how have your previous experiences, whether in different careers, roles, um, graduate paths, other academic paths, um, how have they affected your practice as an attorney today, different experiences that you have taken from and learn and, and apply today as an IP attorney? So for me, uh, uh, I mean, the graduate exper- graduate school experience was, was great in many respects, right? I think I did a lot. I was young, right? After you get your bachelor's, you're still young. So for me, that those years were really important um, to learn and to develop my own thinking and my writing skills and my presentation skills. So it was a lot of learning and growth on that area. And uh, because I do patent law and I now work in a pharmaceutical company, even though ch- science has evolved, so it's not like I'm using the science I learned 20 years ago, it kind of gave me sort of a, a common language with a lot of my clients, and it's really helped uh, my career in building those strong relationships with clients that are scientists. So I think it's, it's, it's been key for me to have that background. That's yeah, definitely something you find throughout our experiences. Like you definitely grow with them and learn how to apply them to who you are today. Um, So Elaine, what about, oops, sorry about that. (laughs) Something about, well, Elaine Anthony, the slide likes you. So what about your experience? What are your Uh, past experiences, whether role, career, other academic or, you know, outside experiences? What have you learned from there that you apply today as an IP attorney? Uh, yeah, I, I think my answer would be simple. I don't have a lot of uh, work experience prior to my career as an attorney, but I think what helped me is just kind of being open to trying new things. Um, just because when you know uh, when you're going into law school, you still uh, most of us don't really know what we want to do. And being able to try a lot of new things, and I was fortunate enough to get a summer and associate position um, after my first year with Densmore and Scholl. And uh, the way our program works, we get to try different things in each department. And uh, from, from each group, we get to pull it out of the portal. And uh, I already had an idea you know, in my head that I wanted to do and practice IP and trademarks and copyrights. And um, we got, I got a few projects there. And it just, you know, I just kind of loved it. I said, this is a natural fit. And it made sense for me to do that there. Um, as far as like my experiences, prior to, you know, law school altogether. It just kind of, you know, being open to things and different changes and trying, I mean, I, I was, uh, I worked for a, uh, a, a local sen- senator in, uh, in California and just figuring out what works. And I, I realized I liked working with people. And, uh, you know, I, I always knew I wanted to go to law school, but I, I was able to hone in on exactly what I wanted to do because I realized I wanted to, um, create partnerships with people and, and have relationships. And it's easiest to do that, I think, in the IP field. I think that's very important, definitely. And Elaine, what about you? What are, um, what are some, I know you talked about it in terms of how you first were directed toward a path in IP, but are there certain aspects more than how you first directed, but Teachings you apply to your career even today from some of your earlier experiences? So I, I, I think I was lucky in that I had a focus early on. So I knew when I graduated uh, from, from Maryland that I was pursuing um, uh, IP as I was getting my JD gr- degree. So with that in mind, um, I sat for the patent bar um, my second year in law school, I wanted to become a patent agent and start get, gaining um, experience and kind of set myself ahead of uh, some others. And so I sat for the patent bar 
and passed that. And then I was able to get a job um, at actually that small Bethesda practice that I mentioned. And I did patent searching at the patent office when it used to be lo located at Crystal City. So they hired me as a law clerk to do these searches. So they would have a lot of small clients that would come in, um, independent inventors, and it would be a description of the invention. And I would have to go talk to examiners, determine the, the class set and subclasses it was in, and actually search these physical, what they call the patent office shoes. There was a big public search room that had just, um, uh, just shelves upon shelves upon shelves of shoes. And you could look at every class and classification that once you've talked to the examiner that you've identified to try to find uh, similar patents to determine whether they want to actually seek for patent protection. So that was really interesting. And that kind of set me up to understand the searching aspect that patent examiners have to undertake. And even now, sometimes when I'm dealing with restriction reject rejections, I know the classification system, so I can kind of go through that a little bit. So that, that was an inter interesting experience. But I also think that's important to know that you can sit for the patent bar if you have your if you have your technical degree, uh, there's uh, requirements. You don't actually need some. Some only require, I think, thirty some credits of a hard science. So if you didn't actually get your, uh, you know, a engineering or a biology or hard science degree, and that kind of sets you up to be able to do some work as as a patent agent. So that's something I would recommend. Something I did early that really helped me uh, in my career. And this patent searching, they don't do that anymore. Thank God, you don't want to be doing that. <laughs> but it was an interesting experience that, that I had early on. Yeah, it's, it's surprising to think about how even, you know, years into a practice, you can think about something as a student or in your first one or two years of practice that to this day, that was a teaching moment that you can still apply. So thank you all for, for those answers. The next question is, as, as an IP attorney today, what are different organizations that you would recommend an aspiring IP attorney um, to to join or take a look into joining, and even beyond those organizations, what are different experiences that you would recommend for them to look into pursuing? So, Lane, since we are on you, I'm going to bounce this question back to you. Well, this is an IPO uh, webinar, so the first organization I would recommend joining is um, Intellectual Property Owners Association. This has been a wonderful organization. Uh, we're part of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And I would say not just to join a particular organization, but to um, become a part of it, like volunteer to be on a committee that actually does work. So when I joined the IPO, um, I, I guess about two years ago, I went to one of their meetings. It was a spring meeting. It was a smaller meeting. And I was able to be um, included in a paper that talked about uh, gender pay disparities. And so I worked together with a small group and was able to get, um, you know, author a white paper on this issue. And so there's a lot of opportunities for authoring papers, um, building relationships, networking. I mean, networking is going to be huge for you all. And uh, it's important to start it early. And I know as a younger associate, I thought, oh, yeah, I don't want to go to these conferences. I'm an introvert. I don't feel like talking to anyone, you know, that kind of thing. But that it, it is when you work on these committees that the group gets smaller and so you can collaborate and build relationships so i really would recommend ipo as an organization but also to join specific committees within it and volunteer to get in, uh, involved in a paper or another aspect within the committee i also recommend aipla i'm also involved in aipla and heavily in the, the women's committee in that organization again um, volunteer for leadership positions they every People are looking for, leadership is looking for uh, lawyers or students that are interested in becoming involved and helping out. And we're really trying to accomplish a lot in our missions. And so that that would be um, a great way to get to know people and to network because that, that will be very important to you. Your network is is really very essential into your, for your practice of law. Uh, I would also say uh, there are some diversity organizations for everyone who's diverse. Uh, MCCA is a Minority Corporate Council Association. I went to a conference last year for the first time and was part of a pitch session they had to six in-house uh, attorneys, and that was a wonderful experience. And so I would recommend joining diversity organizations such as MCCA or LCLD. 
And I'm, I'm also part of a board of a nonprofit called No More Stolen Childhoods. And I would recommend that type of work also as well. It might not be something you do right away, but it's um, having some board experience is also helpful uh, in advancing your career and also uh, to feel like you're giving back. So there are a lot of different organizations. There's also CHIPS, but um, I, those are kind of, I think, AIPLA, IPO, and some of the diversity organizations are the ones I would recommend to start with first. Oh, thank you. Gloria, what would you add to that as well as, um, you know, with your background in, in going through academia to the point of a, a PhD and then a JD as well, um, are there organizations at school right now that you would also recommend um, somebody joining? So I think Elaine did a wonderful job. I mentioned a, a lot of the organizations I was going to mention. I think, you know, IPO, AIPLA are probably the, the, mo the major organizations that sort of nationwide. Um, I know some of the other minority organizations, the Hispanic National Bar Association has a wonderful program for law students called the IP Law Institute. You have to apply and they select about 30 students and they that are interested in careers in patent law and they it's like a two or three day session so that's really excellent um so that's something to look 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 into um and i think just i agree with anything everything elaine said just try to get as much experience as you can as many uh, speaking engagements as you can as many pro bono opportunities as you can and say yes to any opportunity that come your way because every little bit helps and it builds into something great uh you know after a few years you just have to be patient and you know continue uh joining organizations volunteering and just doing whatever you can just say yes to as many things as possible i really think that that's helpful thank you for that and lee anthony what would your advice be um broadly in terms of different organizations and their volunteering um, opportunities for a student right now aspiring to be an IP attorney? Uh, yeah, I think it, it's important to uh, cover several areas. Number one, you want to join an organization that uh, will provide you the training and, and information that you need that will allow you to develop the skills that you want. Um, so for me, IPO is great. Uh, IPO annual meeting provides several different uh, um, CLE opportunities continuing legal education, and they've got great uh, speaking sessions. Uh, I was able to attend one last year on um, uh, open source software, which is definitely relevant to what I do. Um, and then their trademark session is also really good. Um, another one for uh, you know, learning and uh, information and continuing your, your actual legal development, for me, is IAPP, um, for information privacy. Uh, that, that work ties directly uh, with a lot of the, the IP work that I do it oftentimes um, and securing and protecting that IP and making sure it doesn't get into the wrong hands. So um, the, the definitely the, the, uh, the institution that will help you learn skills. And then also I would say it's important to uh, make sure you cover both the local and national base. I'm also involved with Cincy IP here locally uh, in the Cincinnati area. There's a great opportunity to meet and uh, uh, interact with local attorneys in your area, just so you can kind of um, figure out what's needed in your area, how you can fit in and actually get some mentorship. Um, when you're first starting off, mentorship is going to be huge for you. Uh, you want to find mentors and develop mentors. And, um, and I think the more you go out there, the better that's going to be. Now, you can't always fly to, uh, you know, the annual IPO meeting, uh, depending because it, it moves there in different cities every year. So having that local um, group, is definitely very important. Oh, that's great advice. And I think that um, one common theme that I'm definitely hearing from the panelists is really take this time to figure out what are the organizations that could help you grow, volunteer, take ownership, you know, be a leader, really take this time to put yourself out there and find those mentors and ask those questions as you volunteer and get involved. Um, on that, just going to this next question, now that you are a IP attorney and as there's that old adage of hindsight is 2020, what do you wish looking back was some advice you had been given when you were a student 
thinking about starting a career in IP. Okay, I think we'll ask you first since we're on your slide. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I think I would I would go back to that last point. Um, I know when you're starting off in, in law school, you're, everyone's focused on getting good grades, and I think that should be the focus. But uh, I think it's also a good idea to start getting out there and and finding those mentors. Um, there were a few groups that I didn't find out until I was a third year law student, and I'm like, man, it would have been great if I'd have. Uh, been able to join this. I think the ABA has their law student, uh, I can't remember the, the entire acronym, but it's LSAG. Great group to join while you're in law school. You get to, to uh, interact with like-minded law students um, and learn from them, and then also interact with the practicing attorneys because you get to help them schedule their, their events and uh, um, um, go to, a lot of times, I think they provide the, the scholarships to go to the events. And um, anytime you're getting opportunities to go to things for free during law school, I think you should take it. I think that's great. And I, I am hearing a theme of say yes to these opportunities, seek them out, and just say yes. With that in mind, Elaine, um, what would some advice be that you would give to you, or would give to yourself now if you could travel back in time and, and talk to yourself as a student? So I'm going to say the opposite of saying just say no. Um, I think learning to say no is important um, as, as a young attorney to understand because you don't want to take on more than you can handle. Um, you don't want to get yourself into a position where you, you want to please everybody and you're taking on way too much and you don't end up doing um, a job that you wanted to do. And so I would say, don't be afraid to say no. And maybe your no can look like, um, I really want to, I really want to do this work for you. Here's what I'm currently doing. Um, if this can be shifted and just kind of, kind of put it back into the partner's hands to say, um, you can negotiate kind of what, what I can do because I really do want to help you. Um, this is what I have come immediately on my plate. So, I think not being afraid to say no to something, because sometimes we end up, um, especially a type A, taking on too much and we get overburdened. And sometimes it's really important to say no and when to say yes and when to say no. So I think uh, looking back then, I wish I wish I knew a little bit about that more. It's it's easier as you get older to be able to say no and take take some things off your plate. I think that's really important as much as, you know, there's advice to seek out opportunities. There's also a, a balance and a time management aspect that's critical as well to make sure that you're fully committing to those opportunities that you do say yes to. I think, Gloria, um, the same question in terms of both not just student, but also a first or second year IP attorney, what is advice you would give if you could travel back in time, give to yourself then. Yeah. So, so I can think my advice would be to just be patient. I know, I, at least for me, I was very anxious at that, you know, first day, you know, legal job to get those experience and, you know, to prove myself and to kind of do it all. And uh, it takes time, and I wish, so I, I had a lot of anxiety my first year, second year, third year, just a lot of anxiety to prove myself. And I know my fellow um, uh, lawyers that were also the one in, in, my fellow lawyers, even when we started law school, not, not only in law school, but at, uh, at the law firm, we were all super stressed out. We all wanted to do it all and, you know, take the positions and do everything. And, I just wish I had been kinder to myself and be more patient because it will happen. Um, if you're persistent and you prove yourself, it, it's going to happen. Um, so that allows you, I think, to focus more on the job and less on the stress of getting there so fast. Well, now traveling I'm towards here. yourself now, yeah, traveling through time back to today on a flipping coin on that question, what are some insights throughout your experience you've gained that you can some, you know, two or three key bullet points, if it comes down to that, that you would like to share with the group? What have you learned from your experiences then to today that really provides you, no matter, you know, where you are in your career, 
you follow these rules from what you've learned? So, not sure I'm understanding the question, but I think, if, you know, sort of the rules uh, to be, be kind and be patient for yourself, I think, um, and, and it falls on what Elaine said, when to say, I, I say, say yes to everything, Elaine's like, well, maybe not everything, but um, I, I think you have to know when to say yes and when to say no and know when it's okay to overstretch yourself and also know when when you're just so overstretched that you can't do it enough. I know I say yes probably to more things than, than most people did and, and for me it turned out well. I, I was super stressed out um, and I think it would have all been more manageable um, to do all those things without the anxiety. So I think if you focus on doing the things and not worry so much about being overstretched or the consequence, at least for me and my personality, that worked well. I would rather, you know, say yes when assignment on Friday that everybody else will say no so that they didn't have to work over the weekend. To me, that opened so many doors because people came to me because they said I would say yes and I would say yes with a good attitude. So I hear you, Elaine, by, you know, you don't want to overstretch yourself, but it also, it opened so many doors for me personally to say yes when other people were saying no. So I don't know, I think you just have to judge sort of what type of person you are and, you know, what you're willing to sacrifice and, and sort of how you want it to look like for yourself. And I think we all have different personalities, so it works differently for all of us. I think that's pretty key that there is no one size fits all, but it's where it's helpful to learn from a variety of different experiences and perspectives. Um, so definitely thank you for your answer. Elaine, with that um, in mind, so for the insights, it's more of a broad-based question. You can really share anything that you feel like sharing insights now that you want to provide to the group from all your experiences till now. Um, some areas, if you want to share, might be insights in, with respect to work-life balance or self-care or certain things, like no matter where you are in your career, the, the rules I was mentioning, like things you follow, like Gloria had mentioned, to be patient, um, anything of that nature, what are some insights that you can share along those lines with the group? So I'm, I'm laughing at Gloria because um, I can I can relate to the experience of being the associate on Friday afternoon and my phone would ring. And you look at the phone and you think, oh gosh, do I really want to answer that? <laughs> But it, it really did open the door because they, I, I remember a partner saying to me at, the po at that point, we, we love that, we know that you are one of the only associates that will answer your phone on a Friday afternoon. So beware everybody, <laughs> your phone rings on Friday afternoon. Uh, there could be a weekend project. And I did answer my phone um, to, and it, that, that built a lot of rapport. So that, that's an, I'm gonna, important aspect as well. I would say for me over the years, um, something that has been important when we talk about a lot of heritage is having that life work balance. And we're all different. Um, for me, I agree to projects and things I probably shouldn't have agreed to. I mentioned earlier about being involved in a litigation uh, in the Eastern District of Texas that took me away from my children who were three, five, and seven at the time for about four weeks. It was in Texas. I live in Baltimore. It was very hard to go back and forth. I couldn't go back and forth. And so at that point, uh, even though it was mostly there to do prosecution, I had agreed to get involved in this litigation to help, help write a brief as being out of Pro Hoc Vice. And then I got entrenched in a trial that I, I probably could have said no to. Uh, there was a huge litigation team. I, I wasn't second or third chair. And um, in, in retrospect, I wish I would have um, said no, uh, I can provide support in another way. Um, so those kind of things of making sure that um, you take care of yourself and your family, I think that's the most important. And uh, again, just take on opportunities um, where it's going to build you. It's going to, of course, support your firm and, and your career, but also making sure kind of having that life work balance in perspective. And, um, you know, don't don't be afraid if, if you get, and I feel like I have through the different positions I've had, to finally get to a position where you feel like I'm really at a very good balance now. 
Um, and you all are really lucky. You're coming in into a time where firms have reoriented their thinking from when I entered the profession in the mid nineties. And, and these things like work-life balance or life work balance are kind of everyday things we talk about. There are reduced hour schedule. There's um, that maternity leave at, at, at most every firm. So um, it, enjoy that aspect. Paternity leave is tell, it, it, as well. There's there are definitely more programs that are available. So and with COVID, quite frankly, there's a lot more opportunity to work remotely if that's what you want to do. Some people love being in the office, but some people do like to work remotely. So I'm hoping that through COVID, people will have the opportunity to be able to work remotely and just get more of a balance and not have to sit in traffic if they don't want to. So um, yeah, I think considering the life work balance, that's an important aspect. And I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful that you all hopefully will be having a different experience than a lot of us uh, went through, um, you know, some 20, 20 some years ago. Thank you. And Lee Anthony, as a associate right now in a law firm and focusing on trademarks and copyrights, um, what are some of your insights that you can share? Really, again, broad question, but you know, whether it's something just to the group as a whole or things that you've learned that you believe will stay with you throughout your career, what are some of those, those points you would like to share? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll uh, keep it brief to allow for uh, some questions and answer right after. But I think uh, it's important to realize uh, once you graduate law school, you, it's not it's not done. You're not over. Um, let's say the the USPTO releases some guidance on their uh, uh, on um, um, trademark applications or or the CARES Act uh, and and deadlines extension. You should be one of the first to read it and, and circulate it to the group. It'd be helpful. It'd be something somewhere where you can uh, build up your expertise and someone uh, a way for you to provide value as a young associate. Uh, you know, if if the TTAB, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, releases some guidance on um, protective orders, um, be the first to read it. Know it. Um, so when a partner comes and looks at you uh, about uh, discovery you're able to say, you know what, I'm already on top of it, I read it, here's, the, here's my assessment of the situation. I think it's helpful to have that background and to, to have that mind to um, partners and the clients you work for. Oh, thank you. And I think um, just to let people know, we are going to save some time for Q&A. Um, so if you have some questions, feel, please feel free to start chatting or using the chat box to ask a question and we can look through them um, to ask the panelists as well. I think overall a common theme that I was picking up from the responses was really um, both self-care, how to have balance between, you know, work-life balance or as I've heard it called as well, a work-life blend. And then also really those soft skills um, which are also important, such as, you know, when you are a developing associate, being able to pick up that firm or that, that phone call from at a firm, the phone call from a partner and really being able to avail yourself of these opportunities. So we have, um, let's see, we have a question from Sarah Sue for Lee Anthony or and open to anyone else as well. We read it out to the group. She's a, Sarah Zulandu, she's a recent graduate. She graduated in May and she's trying to find a job at a trademark copyright firm. She's found that in the current environment, because of COVID, um, a lot of firms have been hard hit by COVID or having hiring freezes. In your, is it your perspective that work and IP has thrived up in COVID or is it the type of thing where you believe firms will start hiring again soon and it's really just um, basically impacted because of the environment? Um, and if not, at what point do you think it is worth it to give up on IP and try to start a career in a different legal area? Um, so I guess the point of the question is, has it really, how's the impact been on IP? Is there still work in IP or is this really, or hiring freezes generally more of a COVID-related item? And Lee Anthony, what is your take on that? Um, I, I guess the, the first answer is, you know, how, what's the work like? Um, I think we've had a steady workflow um, since March on. I think uh, as far as my billable month, I think 
April might have been my highest month of my uh, our, our billable annual year. Um, and then it's continued. July has been another busy month for us. So I think there's this, the work is there still. Um, I don't think the interest in protecting your IP, you know, trademarks, copyrights, um, uh, is what I can speak from. Um, I don't think the interest in that has, has gone away from the client side. I think in terms of getting a job, I think uh, I, I wouldn't say, you know, just give up. I think, uh, you know, persistence pays in a lot of these situations. If you um, convince, I think most law firms and, and also in-house positions, they're looking to hire people who have got some kind of training already for the most part. I think uh, a lot of uh, my take on it is probably a lot of those, those uh, you know, first year entry level positions, they're a little bit hard to come by now. But if you can convince the, the folks hiring that you've got, um, you know, enough background and something to work with there. So if you do some self-study and, and kind of show that you've got the background, you've got the, some of the knowledge and, you know, the, the raw tools that are available and there to be molded, I think um, there will be eventually someone to take a chance on. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Elaine or Gloria, if either one of you wanted to answer that question as well from your perspective, do you believe that um, there's still, you know, a good amount of work in IP right now or and that the hiring um, issues might be more COVID related or what your perspective on that is at the mm -hmm. moment? So I work for a pharmaceutical company, so we are super busy, probably busier than pre-COVID, and uh, we have continued to uh, to try to hire and, you know, have even a hard time finding people that are applying to jobs with the qualifications that we need. Um, you know, having said that, I think every area is a little bit different. Um, I do not have that experience with copyright law, so I, I can't comment on, on that um, aspect of IP. And I think, Gloria, just while we're on you, there was a follow-up question. Um, because you work at Merck, somebody was curious about your specific degree or PhD. Um, the question was wondering if it was more like biosciences based. So just to explain or expand upon your degree a little bit and how it applies to your work today. So my, uh, my degree is officially microbiology. Um, for my PhD, I studied the HIV virus and uh, replication. Um, I think a lot of people that work at Merck have, um, the patent attorneys at least, have a science background, and most of them is either chemistry or some sort of biology or molecular biology or biotechnology uh, or microbiology, something in that area. Okay, thank you. The next I mean, I question, and we, we probably... haven't mentioned. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I just wanted to say, because I think for, for people on the call, I mean, for, for a patent prosecutor or, uh, and to speak for the patent bar, a science background is required. There's a, a certain amount of credits that you need in the science arts to be able to speak for the exam. But, you know, there's, we haven't talked about patent litigation. And for patent litigation, a lot of my colleagues do not have a, a science background, right? Um, they get into the field and they're just really good litigators and they get whatever technical support that they need either from, you know, technical advisors, just scientists, or for patent prosecutors. So just because you don't have a background uh, in science doesn't close the doors to all type of patent law. I just wanted to mention that. No, that's a great point. And actually, that did remind me, Gloria, I wanted to tell people on the call because a lot of people as students probably aren't as versed in the acronyms or the um, colloquialisms of, of being an IP attorney. Um, if When you've been hearing us talk about prosecution in both the patent and trademark world, that really means more of the transactional or paper-based work of trying to work towards getting a patent application or trademark application granted, more the back and forth with the examining office. Um, and at the same time, when you, when you talk about litigation, aside from what's called you know, transactional work in uh, when you're a lawyer with patent litigation and trademark litigation as well, you're not required to have a specific technical background. So that's definitely key to note. I think this next question um, is a question about for taking the patent bar exam. 
What advice would you guys give to someone who is preparing for the patent exam right now? Um, Elaine, do you want to go ahead and, and take that one? Sure. I would um, recommend um, signing up for a review course. I did, um, I think there's PLI as one. I did patent resources group and I took a week off um, and attended, uh, I think it was nine to five, uh, one of those sessions and um, was able to prepare for the patent bar. I had no practical experience. I had never seen an application. I didn't know what the MPEP was. I, I really had no practical experience. So I would recommend taking one of those courses. And I imagine during COVID, a lot of them are online or self studies. So you there, it's, it's not, I would say the patent bar exam to me, and maybe because I was still uh, a law student was a harder exam than the state bar. Um, and it could have been because the year I took it actually was, I think the passage rate was 33%. Uh, but, uh, and the questions were really very difficult, um, but it, it, I had no practical experience. So that it does make it more difficult if you you really don't have a context in, in what what the MP is about, MPEP is about, and and some of the varying um, office actions and responses and these nuances of patent law that that you learn during practice. But if you don't have any practical experience and you haven't gained experience as a as a law clerk, I would suggest taking one of these courses that should run about a week, but I don't know how, how long they are now, but I would highly recommend taking one of those courses. It helped me pass the patent bar. Yes, and just to follow up on that, I know there's always a question of should you wait, you know, while you're working as an attorney to take the patent bar, should you take it ahead of time in, in law school? There's pros and cons to both, but if you have that skill set before and you're interviewing, I don't see how that could be a negative because people know that you've already jumped ahead on the learning curve by knowing some of this, the rules and the terminology. Um, there are a few other questions that we've, we've touched upon, but just to reiterate, there's some questions about um, somebody mentioning that they have a finance background. Is there a spot for them in IP? Yes, definitely. You know, you can work on more. There, you might not be a patent prosecutor, but there's definitely other areas of IP, copyrights, trademarks, licensing, you know, software licensing, things of that nature, and litigation, as mentioned before. Even patent litigation doesn't require someone to have actually have sat for the patent bar or have that technical background. So there's definitely a spot in IP um, for anybody you know, graduating from law school. Um, the other question is, is it for patent litigation again, do you have to have patent prosecution experience? No. And then what's the likelihood for a recent graduate to obtain a remote position in an IP firm? Um, see if you happen to live in an area that there's not too many patent practice firms. I guess, Aline, since you work at a remote firm, do you want to take that one on as well? So I would say um, it, it is a tough situation with COVID. Um, our firm is still hiring, but we hire more, again, people who have some experience. Um, I would say the patent office is a wonderful place to start. You will be trained there. You can work remotely if need be. And um, I, I would look to see if they have any offerings during COVID. I don't know if their hiring has changed during COVID. Another thing to think about if you work at the patent office, you can wave in to become, to get your uh, registration number. Uh, I think if you practice four years as a patent examiner, you can wave in without having to sit for the patent bar. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, they have very flexible work options. They have some four day work week options um, and good benefits and great training. So I would recommend, especially during this season where a lot of law firms are uh, concerned about, and, and some of them are quite frankly downsizing, concerned about what things will look like over the next year. The patent office is a great resource for positions and training. So I would recommend that. Definitely. And I think we um, are closing out on the hour, but just as more of a question, maybe any final thoughts or conclusions from our panelists. There was a question I'll paraphrase a bit in terms of, um, in Elaine, this was mentioned that, you know, there was a, a question talking about how Heritage and Heritage is known for diversity for minority attorneys. I think for all of us across our experiences, we've definitely been seeing, especially with IPO and the DNI committee, this commitment as well. Um, how do you feel that this commitment benefits the organizations at large with this diversity um, impact and, and commitment. 
And then also any final thoughts you have. And just to let everybody know, you know, this is um, a webinar today that we're very excited to host for everyone. And hopefully we can definitely, you know, create a series of these to take questions as they appear. I'm sure any of the panelists would be more than happy to answer questions after words that might come their way. Um, but with that, um, Elaine, since we're on you, do you want to give the final answer and then we'll go to Lee Anthony and Gloria? Yeah, so our firm, Herity & Herity, uh, has a, a diversity commitment. I think a lot of firms have uh, a diversity committee. I chair that committee. And part of it, we have a lot of outreach, similar to what I'm doing here at IPO. So it's a good fit for me to be part of the outreach committee within IPO. But it's important within Herity, um, we've analyzed the numbers with regard to engineers entering the space. And it really looks um, grim for uh, females and minority candidates entering into our area. The pipeline from engineering schools, especially in the area I practice, which is electromechanical, um, we, we did a recent analysis and found that uh, the percentages of women and minority candidates entering, just even entering into our profession is about under 15% in the electromechanical space. So we're really making a lot of efforts and we realize that we need to try to hit it earlier. We need to try to hit candidates earlier, uh, maybe in engineering schools or et cetera. So uh, my takeaway is if you're a diverse candidate, we need you. Uh, if you're a female or a diverse candidate, we this field absolutely needs you. Uh, there's gonna be wonderful opportunities for you. Get involved. Uh, I'm proud of the things that Heritage is doing and I'm proud of the things this committee is doing um, because we really do want to see the numbers because we believe that diverse um, backgrounds and a diverse opinions will lead to a better work product, a more fulfilling career, and really a more fulfilling life. Oh, thank you for that. I know Gloria um, mentioned she has another call and had to drop off. Um, I don't know, Gloria, if you're still on, if you just wanted to say bye. Might have missed her. Okay, well, that's a teaching moment about the, the world of an IP attorney, but we were definitely very Hi. thankful to have her on this call. I'm still here. Oh, okay, perfect. I'm still here. I just wanted to say goodbye. It was nice talking to everyone. Uh, feel free to email me if you have a follow-up question. And uh, I'm glad the IPO is doing this, and I'm proud of all the efforts that uh, all the organizations um, are, are putting into talking about careers in patent law and maybe increasing our diversity numbers. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Gloria. And Lee Anthony, do you have um, some final words as well? Uh, yes, I, I think um, across the, the industry and, and the legal profession, we've seen a lot of firms um, take different positions with respect to diversity. I know Dinsmore and Scholl has been very committed to diversity, and especially our, in our IP department. Um, we, we'd like to, to um, talk about walking the walk. And uh, it's just very, it's very good to see. Um, that said, there's a long way to go. Um, and, and so I will uh, definitely uh, support what Elaine said. If you're a diverse, um, you know, student right now or a diverse uh, applicant, uh, we need you. The, the industry needs you. And please keep, keep moving forward and uh, go out there and don't be afraid to apply and uh, hone your craft and, and uh, work on your skills. And uh, the industry and the IP field will welcome you. Definitely. Well, thank you all. Definitely appreciate all of our panelists' time and attention, just responses, and I'm sure all of the attendees have appreciated your, your time as well. Um, thank you, everyone who has attended. Again, feel free to reach out to any of the panelists if you have any further questions uh, via email. You can find their emails on their um, on their websites or you have through the flyer where you found out about this event or the web invite my email feel free to reach out to me and i can provide you with emails of anyone that you would like to contact with further questions with that thank you again all for your time and attention and i hope you all have a great rest of your day and we'll wish you farewell bye everyone <laughs>